So a just a little introduction today, we will have our very own local historian, Michelle. She's going to be giving you a presentation on the local history of Shanahan and Manuka. So with that, Michelle, take it away. Thanks, Parker. Um, hi, um, my name is Michelle Roberts Hutchins, and I'm the local historian for the Three Rivers Public Library District. I've lived in Manuka almost my whole life. I grew up here on a farm just north of town, um, and I love our area. Um, I, I, the area that I, our local history department encompasses has a very rich and interesting history. Um, when I talk about our local history, I like to go back and talk about the people who lived here as far back as we know. The first group of Native Americans who lived in this area were called the Mound Builders. Um, they were considered prehistoric and they, um, they there's, excuse me, there's two burial mounds uh, from the Indian culture of the Langford Upper Mississippian tradition that are located south and east of Shanahan along the Desplaines River. Um, between the town of Shanahan and I-55. <clears throat> and these uh, burial mounds were, were considered to be from 1200 to 1500, according to a 1978 University of Illinois survey of the site. Uh, in 1964, the Southwest Mound was excavated and the remains of 16 people were found. Um, the bodies remain in the site and the mound was restored. This is this like this is on private property, but there is a parking area where you can to go view, view it. There are some artifacts that were found around this site in a display case at the Three Rivers Library in Shanahan, if you'd be interested in going to see them. Um, as the Europeans and other people encroached on the Native American populations to the east. Of course, the populations were pushed westward. Here's another view of the mound with the river in the background. In 1673, uh, Jacques Marquette and Louis Joliet explored the Mississippi River for France, the Mississippi River Valley, to see if they could go from the Great Lakes to the Atlantic Ocean, uh, the Gulf of Mexico by the Mississippi River. Um, on their way back, they met a group of Illini Indians uh, who were the Native Americans that were living in this area at this time. And they told them about the shortcut they could take to go up what we know now as the Illinois River to uh, little swampy area on Lake Michigan called Chicago, which meant like a stinky marsh was what the original meaning, meaning was. In their report, uh, they said, we can easily go to Florida by boats and a very good navigation with, with excuse me, um, with straight movement. There will be just one canal to make and then by cutting half a league of prairie from the Lake of the Illinois, which was Lake Michigan, to the St. Louis River, which is the Illinois River, which empties into the Mississippi. So that was the first talk in 1673 of building a canal through this area to connect Lake Michigan with the Mississippi River. One of the first um, towns in this area that we know of, the, the Native Americans were forced to sign a treaty in 1829, and they were forced to move to the West to reservations. And after 1829, the white settlers came from the East to put down roots and stay. Up until then, there were fur traders and trappers up and down the rivers and streams but they didn't leave any records, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, so after 1830, people started putting down roots and leaving records. A man named Salmon Rutherford uh, came to this area 
from the east and he planted the village of Dresden along the Illinois River. And this is where today's Dallinger Pumpkin Farm is located. This was actually the first town in the area. He had a little inn there uh, and it became a stagecoach stop. And the, the, the people, the travelers, the settlers, they would follow the Native American trails and they eventually became the roads. So the canal road that's along there was started out as a Native American trail and the, the stagecoaches eventually came along. <laughs> Excuse me. Mr. Rutherford's town never really turned into much, but there was uh, an inn there and then a second inn was built next to it by a man named Antoine Peltier. It had the first uh, post office in Grandy County. They had stores that sold supplies to the settlers. There was a post office, um, I mentioned that. <laughs> it was the, the first Catholic church in Grandy County was built there. The cemetery uh, from the Catholic church still stands today. It's called St. Anthony Cemetery. Um, a lot of the, the stones are gone, uh, but the, the people are trying to Main, they're maintaining it now, and it's a quiet, peaceful place. A man, a trapper named Marquis, started, actually, the legend is that he started the cemetery. Uh, there was a family in 1829 who were trying to cross the river, and some of them drowned in the river. He found the bodies and took them up to the top of the hill where the cemetery is and bury them. And that's the legend of how that cemetery got started. This is a painting of the area. Uh, it was painted by a man named Henry Francis Ansley in 1842. And he was from Canada. He was a soldier in Canada and he was traveling through this area. And as you can see in these, the picture, let find my laser pointer. Uh, this is the Dresden Inn, and that building is still standing there today. And you can see the, the canal road that winds along. Now, the canal isn't there yet, but the, ri the river is there. There was a couple islands right there. There's no trees. Uh, you can see the prairie. Um, they say the prairie grass sometimes was higher than the, a man on horseback. And along here is probably where the Oxable Creek comes into the river. Um, this painting, the actual painting is owned by the Chicago Historical Society Museum. Uh, we like to get our hands on it and hang it here because we think that's where it belongs. Um, pointer. This is the, the, the inn, the Dresden Inn. It's the Dallinger's family farm now, and it still is standing. Um, it was an inn. People would stop there with their, their on horseback and on stagecoaches and spend the night and have a meal and move on their way. Now, across the road was what's locally known as the Mule Barn because it's right on the banks of the canal, but it was actually built to store grain so the farmers could bring their grain to the canal and that store it there until it was able to be loaded onto the canal barges and taken to the people in the cities. And this building's three stories tall and the interior of it is, doesn't have any nails in it. It's all constructed of the tongue and groove construction. And that's still standing there today. I'm not used for cattle anymore, I don't think, or mules. Now, the village of Shanahan was started. It was actually uh, the site of a huge Potawatomi village. Um, they said there was about 10,000 Potawatomi lived there where the waters meet, which is what the meaning of Shanahan is in the Potawatomi language. Um, <clears throat> after the the... Native Americans were forced to leave this area. The, the settlers came in the early 1830s and settled Shanahan. 
uh, when the canal started coming through, um, ground was broken in 1846 for the for the Canal. And the site of Shanahan was the site of, is still the site of two lots, lot six and lot seven. And the, the town was laid out in the shape of a, a tornado a triangle. And um, the business end was down this end between the two, the two lots. Now, this is a picture of a barge after it came through lot six, the lot tender's house would be right up here on the hill that's still standing there. And there's the bridge and there's a little houseboat there on the side. This is lock seven and there's a little house there for the lock tenders. Sometimes it would take up to eight hours to get a boat to, to go through the locks. So this little house gave them a place to get out of the weather and, and wait while the, the locks, the boats went through the locks. They say the lock tenders had to be big and strong men because they had to move these big doors on the on the locks to allow the boats to get in and out. Uh, sometimes they had to settle fights on who got to go through the locks first because the it was first come first serve. And if one boat was coming one way and another the other way, there was sometimes little fights would break out. There was quite a few businesses in the town of Shanahan right around that area. These people had to have something to do while they were waiting for the boats to be locked through. And just north of Lock 6, on the other side of um, the highway, the road, the bridge over the, the canal and the river is what's called the wide water. And that was where the boats were able to tie up and wait till it was their turn to go through the lock. This is another view that's lock six over here. And this is where the pedestrian bridge is now to, to walk over. Uh, this is before the dam was put in and the, probably a flood or something had taken the bridge out that the mules used to walk on to, to tow the boats across the you know. This is one of the few places in Illinois where the river actually crosses the canal or the canal crosses the river, it depends on how you I want to look at it. And this is a stylized uh, painting drawing of one of the houses along the canal. This is uh, the John McGowan house and it's today it's the Mead home which is um, along the canal at, right at the curve of the Manuka Shanahan blacktop. Um, but it made it look very nice and fancy and pretty when it was just a, probably just a farm. This is a picture of the dam um, after it was constructed. This is from the 1930s and kids used to go and swim there and slide down the dam and um, they had a lot of fun, but it's, the views changed so much now. It's everything's grown up and, and very different. This is a picture of the confluence of the three rivers. This is where I named the three rivers come from. This is where the waters meet, which is the Potawatomi um, meeting of the of Shanahan. Um, up at the top of the screen, this is the Kankakee River. This is the Des Plaines River, and this is where they come together to form the Illinois River. And this is located just along the, the towpath, you can, you can see it if you hike down the towpath just from McKinley Woods. And you can see the canals here in the foreground. Um, there's not a lot of trees. Of course, they couldn't have the trees between the towpath and the, and the canal like we do today because they needed the area for the ropes for the to tow the barges. Um, the Des Plaines River would get so shallow in the summertime that uh, it was just a trickle. You could walk across it. And then in the 1930s, uh, the Army Corps of Engineers came and dredged out the river and made it navigable for barges to use the river. Um, this is a, another picture of the confluence. This is at a later date. This is when they were working on the, the Dresden Lock and Dam, which is located just uh, west of this point. In the 1930s, 
1931, this picture was taken. This is when they were constructing the Dresden Lock and Dam to what we have today in, in the Illinois River. And this made the river navigable from Lake Michigan to the Mississippi River. This was the original Shanahan Schoolhouse. Uh, it stood on the corner where the Pioneer Path School stands today. Uh, it was two stories tall. It was built in, okay, that's my note. <laughs> it was built, I know it was built for $18,000 in uh, 1869. Uh, it housed all grades and it had a two year high school in it. Uh, in 1923, it burnt to the ground. And this was the school that was built after that. And this is, this is where Pioneer Path School is today. And if you stand back on the street, you can see where this peak is in the middle of Pioneer Path School. This had four rooms. It was all the grades and a two-year high school. And in 1947, the high school consolidated with the Manuka High School and the Shanahan students started coming to Manuka to go to high school. This is an aerial view of Shanahan from 1941. And I pointed out a she with the landmarks so you can kind of get a bearing um, where you're at. This is Route 6 right here. Um, I am Canals right here, Shanahan State Park. This is where the lock, the lock tenders house and lock six and seven are. This right here is where the school is, Pioneer Path School, it was in the middle of that big lot. And uh, Shanahan's grown up quite a bit since then. This the main part of town was in this area next near the state park. This is where the post office was and the stores and all the shops on Bridge Street. And things just have progressed since then. In 1852, the Chicago, Rock Island and Pacific Railroad decided to put down tracks through the north eastern corner of Grundy County. A man named Salmon, Ruck, not Salmon Ruckler, Ransom Gardner uh, was a surveyor for the railroad and he purchased 500 acres on the top of this grass covered hill here where they were putting the, going to put the railroad tracks through and planted the town of Manuka. Manuka is a pot, another Potawatomi word, and it means good earth or place of contentment. Uh, one of the most common questions I get asked is, do, is the proper pronunciation Manuka or Manuka? When I was growing up here, we could always tell somebody that wasn't from the area because they would say Manuka. And everybody that lived here says Manuka, said Manuka. That's, that's my theory that Manuka is the proper pronunciation, but it doesn't matter. It's still a good place to live, good place to call home as the village's motto is. Um, there were other families already living in this area and farming here. <clears throat> Excuse me, there were quite a few uh, families who had come to work on the canal. That's where we have quite a few Irish families who put down roots here. Um, it's farmed in the area. This is the original train tracks, um, train station. It stood right along the train tracks, just east of Wabina Avenue. Here's another view of it, looking east, and you can see there's tracks on both sides of this, the station. We had trains coming and going. We had passenger trains and freight trains. And all the way over here to the, the right side of the screen, <coughs> along Wapella Avenue between the train tracks and Wapella were uh, another set of tracks that belonged to the inner urban train. 
And the inner urban train was an electric train. <clears throat> Excuse me, this one ran from Joliet to Princeton, but there were also other lines that, that came off of it. So if you went to Morris, you could get on another inner urban train and that would go north to Yorkville and farther. Um, the, the inner urban was very popular. People would take it and go into Joliet or Morris and go shopping. Manuka only had a two-year high school. And so students, if they wanted to continue their education, would take the interurban train and go to Joliet or Morris to finish their high school degree. Uh, the interurban was active until about the 1930s. And that's when a lot of people were getting their own vehicles. So it was easier for them to drive themselves into the big cities to do their shopping and get their supplies. This is a view from looking north from Wapella Street. Uh, up until 1929, the Railroad tracks were on the level with Mondeman Street and Wapella Street. Uh, there were businesses on both sides of Mondeman Street. You could see this building right here. This is where the um, martial arts school is today and the hair company uh, across the street from these buildings here is where Cookie's Restaurant is today. And if you go up the street here is it was, at the time, it was a Masonic Lodge Hall, but that's where our library is today. In 1929, the Rock Island Railroad <clears throat> decided they needed to lower the tracks because the train was having problems. Get, they were having problems getting the train up the hill into town. Manuka is the highest point on the Rock Island line in Illinois. So early names of the town people, the railroad workers would call it Summit. Uh, it was also called Anoka for a time. But uh, it's, it, uh, the, tra the tracks were lowered. So now we have what we know now today is the lower parking lot on either side of the tracks. The Village Fathers, I read a newspaper article that said they didn't want the if they were going to lower the tracks, the railroad needed to put it lowered enough to put a viaduct over so cars could drive over the tracks and not have to have a dangerous three-way stop at the corner of Mondeman and Wabina. So I guess they knew what they were talking about back then. Um, this was this area, which is a parking lot today, and there's businesses there, it was just grassy, grassy prairie. Grasper. Um, I don't know if you can see the, the in this picture, but over here in the side, there's a cow grazing in the in the picture. This is the inner urban train station. This train the station's still standing today. It's um, just south of the grain elevators along Wapella Avenue. And it's it's empty. It was a business for many, many years, uh, but today it's still standing empty. <clears throat> Over in the background, you can see a three-story building. This was the Manuka Hotel, or the Union Hotel. This building stood on the corner of Wabina and Wapella from the 1860s up until the very early 1960s. Um, with Manuka being a railroad town, people would want to get off the train and have a meal and spend the night, and uh, it was a very popular place. The third story was a big meeting room, a dance hall, a ballroom. Um, I heard it was used for basketball games, but I don't know who really could have done that. But. Now this is a view of Mondeman Street. Um, looking west, this is here's what the building where the hair company is and the martial arts studio. This is right across from Veterans Park. Um, this building was a store, a general store, uh, ever since Manuka was begun up until the mid-1980s um, when bigger stores started to come into town and the little stores 
went by the wayside. Uh, if you can see, if you go stand in this park now in Veterans Park and look down the street, it doesn't look a whole lot different today. Um, there's cars now instead of horses and buggies, but uh, our little downtown area hasn't changed at all. This building is where Cookie's Restaurant is. Uh, you can see the, the top of the building, which is the shrimp barn today. The building that's apartments is it down there too. This is a view looking east from Osceola Street down Mondeman Street. Um, the building on the side here, this is Clennon's Insurance today. And of course, everybody recognizes this building as today's shrimp barn. This building has had many, many different businesses in it over the years. It was the uh, Farmers First National Bank for many years. Um, when I was growing up here, up until the mid-70s, I believe, it was our post office. Um, it's been restaurants and an auto parts store and a resale shop and just a lot of other different businesses have been in that store. Now, next to it, you can see this two-story building. This was the Shepley Hotel. This was another hotel in Manuka. Um, you can see the sheets hanging out on the porch, railing to dry. I don't know how clean they would have got because the streets were pretty muddy and dirty, but that's what they had to do with their sheets. And next to it was a building called the White Building. And that was other businesses in the downstairs. And the second floor had another meeting room, um, a hall where people would have dances and parties and um, we were a very social town over the over the years. People people like to get together and have dances and dinners and play cards and such. You know, in 1887, there were two major fires where the whole downtown of Manuka burnt. Um, it was they were within a couple weeks of each other. And up till that time, Manuka did not have a fire department. They had volunteers. Uh, there was not a water system in town. There was an artesian well that was located right across the street from these buildings. <clears throat> but um, there was nothing they could do to stop the fire. They had to telegraph to Joliet to send horse and buggies fire equipment to try and put the fires out. So this whole downtown part of Manuka burnt down. So these buildings today are just rebuilt as one story buildings. Now this is a picture of, whoops, go back. Okay, here we are. Sorry about that. Um, this was a picture from about 1907, I think of the farmers lined up to bring their grain to the grain elevators. The grain elevators are why Manuka is here. Uh, when the Rock Island line put their tracks down, they put, would make sure there were grain elevators about every 10 miles um, along the track. So the farmers with their horses and buckies could easily get their grain to market so they could load them on the trains and sell them and to bring goods in for the farmers that they couldn't normally get otherwise. Um, so that's why Manuka is about 10 miles from Joliet, 10 miles from Morris, and then there's 10 miles to Seneca and 10 miles to Marseilles and so on. <clears throat> uh, and another interesting fact, Monument is a Potawatomi word that means corn. The, the town of Manuka and the Many of the streets were named by a woman named Dolly Smith. 
And Dolly was the wife of the man who worked for Ransom Gardner, who was the Manuka's first developer. And she spoke Potawatomi. We don't know if she was, she was actually Potawatomi or she just spoke the language, but she named Manuka and many of the streets. So Mondaman means corn, which I just, I'm a farming girl, so I just think that's really appropriate. Um, yeah, I my farm memories here. Um, yeah, so this is the way, and the farmers still line up at the grain elevator today to, to deliver their, their grain, so it gets shipped off to market. This was Manuka's first schoolhouse. This stood on the corner where today's primary center is, across from our Methodist church on the corner of Massasoit and Church Street. And this building was built in the 1860s and it housed all the grades. Um, in 1924, they started to build what's today's primary center. Uh, the old schoolhouse is it's still in the foreground. It's still in use while the new building is being built. Now, the, the, this building housed all the grades, um, first grade all the way through high school. Manuka didn't have a four-year high school until 1942. Up until then, if you, students wanted to continue their education, they would have to go to Joliet or more. So in the 1950s, the classroom wing alongside and the gym was added, the old gym was added. Um, and then in the early 1960s, the elementary school was built just up the top of the hill along Cody Drive, and this became the high school. The, and the central campus building, which I still consider the new high school, was built in um, 1970 was the first year students started to go to school there. Up until they built the new classroom wing with the, with the gym, this was a barn that stood on the corner of Massasoit and Monument Street, right across where the, from our, today's post office. Um, and this was where they played basketball and had dances and things. This is their, their gym, really cold and drafty too. Uh, and now we're to the uh, Three Rivers Public Library, the Manuka Branch. This building was actually built in 1924 as a Masonic Lodge Hall. Um, and it was, there was always a Masonic Lodge Hall on this corner. Uh, and then this building was built in 24. The second floor where today's Youth Services Department is, is the, was where the, the Masons met. On the first floor, there was a stage at the back end where our circulation is desk is today. And this is where they would have all the graduations and parties and dances and programs and everything. This was the social center for Manuka. In the basement where I am sitting right now in our local history room was a kitchen and a dining hall where they would have many dinners and functions down here. In 1924, right after the building was being constructed, a tornado came along and took off the second floor. But they just built, built it back up to where it is today. Uh, I want to talk to you about a little bit for a couple minutes about our local history collection. Like I said, I'm located here in the basement of the Manuka branch. And because I'm not always here, um, I just wanted to let you know, if you contact me and I will do my darndest to make sure that we can open up if you want to come and see the collection or if you have any questions. Um, I like to say that our collection is bits and pieces of this and that from here and there in the Shanahan and Manuka area. Most of the items have been donated. Um, we have Native American artifacts, we have pictures, we have all the high school pictures uh, that hung 
along the hallway of the old high school up until the last year was 1969 when they discontinued doing this. There's memorabilia, um, just a little bit of everything. Here's another view of some of the pictures and the stuff. Everything is from this area. One of our exciting things is that we have here is we have mastodon bones that were found locally uh, in about 1900 on a farm just north of Manuka. And these are on loan from the Field Museum in Chicago. Um, so this is the, the tibia and fibia of a mastodon. Uh, this is our little school setting where I like to talk to school groups and scout groups and any groups about what life was like growing up in the olden days and get, get to sit in the old desks and just get to experience things. Now, I can't have a talk about the history of Manuka without talking about our toboggan slot. This toboggan slide was put up in the 1880s and 1890s and it was on Osceola Street. And it started at the top of the hill uh, near where Church Street intersects with Osceola Street towards the driveway for the elementary school. And it was put up every winter. All the streets were blocked off. <laughs> and it was very, very popular. Um, we think that this actual picture was probably taken in the spring because there's no snow on the ground. But when it was active, they would pour water down the gym so it would freeze. The boards across it right here, probably just to keep people from climbing on it while it's inactive. The man, <coughs> excuse me, who paid to have it put up every year, lived in the big Italianate house that still stands on the corner of Osceola and St. Mary Street. Uh, his name was A.K. Knapp, and he owned the Farmers First National Bank and the lumber yard and the grain elevators. And he and his wife didn't have any children, but they loved the kids. So they would have this put up every year so they could see the kids having fun flying by their house on the toboggan slide. Um, it was very popular. People from different towns had to get tickets on certain nights. Tuesday nights, people from Shanahan could come and Wednesday nights, people from Morris could get tickets. But the Manuka kids got to come anytime they wanted to. And after Mr. Knapp passed away, the people in town just couldn't afford to put it up every year. So that was the end of our toboggan slide. So that's uh, my information about our local history collection. I love to do help people with genealogy. Uh, we've got lots of genealogy files here. Um, if you can't come in, make it in to, to see the collection, just give me a call or email and I will do my darndest to help you out. Um, right now, my hours are usually uh, 4 to 7.30 on Monday evenings, and then the second and fourth Saturday and Sunday. I'm usually here. It's always a good idea to call first, though. <coughs> Excuse me. And I will do my darndest to help you out and um, show you a little bit more about the history of our area. So does anybody have any questions? Parker, are you there? I'm here. Uh, if anybody has any questions, you can either put them in the chat or I will go ahead and let people unmute themselves now. Righty. Well, uh, if there are no more questions, Michelle, thank you very much for coming and talking to us today. If anybody has any, uh, okay, well, if anybody has any questions, feel free to, we have Michelle's information. We'll be making this a video and we'll have it up on our YouTube channel probably in the next day or two. But yes, thank you very much, Michelle. Thank you. All right, everybody. Thank you all for coming tonight. Uh, have a great rest of your night.